4 billion people, 60% of the world's population, 27% of global GDP and rising. Asia is already changing our future. Would it be a prosperous, sustainable future for all? That is both the vision and the question. The Full Global Institute brings Asian perspectives to this global dialogue. We draw together brilliant minds from business, academia, policy making, and civil society. They create new frameworks for interpreting new challenges and opportunities. We think about issues in a way that is broad and deep, Asian yet global. We map changing economic realities from multiple angles to better inform global decision making. We look at how global commerce can adapt to a world that is more populous, more complex, and more questioning. We also engage business fully in this process, for business can turn fresh thinking into action. The big picture is clear. The global economy is rebalancing to the East. It is important for this to be a positive global experience. It matters not just for us, but for those who come after us. For achieving this is the work of generations. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, that's just to wake you up in case you haven't had your coffee yet. <laughs> yeah, the topic this morning is the future of the world and Asia's role. And that little video is really to introduce you to a set of statistics and, uh, and, and we, which, frankly, we're all familiar with. But to keep things in perspective, I think we should also remind everybody that there are over 800 million people in Asia still living below the poverty line of $1.25 a day. Over 360 million still lack access to safe water. And a billion lack access to electric electricity. More than half of the world's elderly people reside in Asia, where really we don't have the means yet and come up with the methods to take care of the agent. Uh, needless to say, all this as Asia continues to grow and consume, and you've heard this many times before, I'm sure, we'll need, we'll need two Earths to sustain Asia. So each of these statistics really uh, thrust upon us a need to absolutely rethink the future, both the, uh, um, um, the, both the opportunities, as you can all see, and also the things that we need to deal with. And I, I think uh, we cannot have a more distinguished panel today uh, than the panel members that we have to really help us think this through. Um, you know, before I, I really turn over to them, I'd just like to say that one of the things that's happened in this world that is flattening is I think a lot of the international and multilateral institutions are really under pressure. Now, why is that so? When, when Asia uh, and the world is becoming more and more globalized, why isn't the role of the multilateral institutions actually becoming more important and being strengthened? But we all know that that isn't the case. And really, uh, um, in, in the trade world, we know that the multilateral system is being eroded, in my mind, by bilateral deals and regional free trade agreements. And also, um, we really need to think about how we actually engage also absolutely big areas which don't fit either into the East or the West uh, of South America, Africa, and areas of the Middle East that really what we have long time called the South. So all that really needs to be fitted in. And then the final thing I would mention is really the role of technology, which is um, one and a factor that will actually impinge on this, if I may say so. And obviously, it will offer a lot of hope for solutions for the future. What is the role of technology? And I, I think uh, all, all these, in my mind, are really all coming together. And how do we put this huge issue, this huge opportunity together, is really something that I think all of you have exercised your minds uh, over the years. 
And let me now turn to our, our panel. Jim Basili from Canada is le a leading mobile technology entrepreneur, was the founder of Research in Motion, and also the uh, founding chairman of our um, partner, CG. And uh, my good friend Ronnie Chan needs no introduction, chairman of Hanglong, very familiar with uh, not, not, only, not only Asia, China, but really the world, and uh, can give a really good business perspective on what's happening in this part of the world as well as uh, globally. And then last but not least, Dr. Marie Pangestu, who's Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy from Indonesia. Uh, Maria has over the years thought long and hard about these issues, uh, starting from uh, a lot of research in the region, from the ASEAN perspective, from the APEC perspective. And before she was Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy, was actually the Trade Minister from, uh, from Indonesia and have had a central role. And uh, I'm sure she will play a, continue to play a central role in the whole trade picture and maybe an even more important role. So, Marie, let me turn to you. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on, on this? Especially, I'd like you to think, um, share a little bit with us your thoughts on you know, what's happening to multilateralism and the future and the next steps in, in developing the multilateral frameworks. Uh, let, me, let me respond on the issue of multilateralism, uh, especially in the trade area. Uh, and I think what's happened uh, in the last 10 years is that the world has changed. And it has changed because uh, you know, when we started the Doha multilateral negotiations, you had clearly developed countries, developing countries, and least developed countries. The term of emerging economies, advanced economies, BRICS, and all that had not uh, appeared. Now, 10 years later, we have what, what's called, uh, often called the multipolar world. Uh, and we know that in the past, all multilateral <coughs> negotiations ha were never completed without US leadership or quad leadership, you know, US, EU, uh, normally. And so, you know, we have been uh, negotiating this multilateral negotiations now for almost 10 years or 11 years. So what are the challenges uh, that, that we see to make sure that uh, we can maintain the strength uh, of the multilateral uh, system? Uh, trade as an example, but I think it plays out, similar issues play out in the other multilateral organizations. I think first of all is how do you accommodate for the changing world, and the world has changed in the trade area, one, multipolar emerging economies. Uh, so you don't have developed, developing, and de least developed. You have inside the developing country box, you have advanced, uh, from advanced to lesser, and you know, all kinds of uh, range. Second, you have uh, the way you do trade, and Victor will attest to this as a global supply chain uh, a manager of <laughs> global supply chain. Uh, the, the way we do trade is so different from 10 years ago. The global value chain, uh, where it's so fragmented and specialized, uh, with services and investment and intermediate uh, components uh, being very important. Third, new issues of trade, whether it's investment, environment, uh, even scarcity of water, scarcity of energy. Uh, these are uh, competition policy. Uh, these are issues which are not in the multilateral negotiations. So if you look at those three challenges, then how do we make sure that the multilateral system can be strengthened. One is how do we accommodate for more shared leadership between the so-called developed countries and the emerging economies. Uh, and my take on that is that emerging economies have to give more, uh, but not as much as uh, advanced countries. This is when you talk about the negotiations. So you have a more uh, nuanced scale of differences, differences in commitments and obligations and, and so on. And emerging economies are also in a position to give more in terms of capacity building to the lesser and least developed countries, not just the advanced countries. And that, if you can get that right and have more balance uh, uh, in, in terms of the negotiations, maybe you can move on. Second, how should uh, the multilateral trading system uh, address new issues? Because that is also for, for the advanced countries. Why are they going into bilaterals and regional agreements? The most, there are three or four being announced just in the last month. US, EU, EU, Japan, and then Japan joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's mainly because they feel the new issues like investment, like uh, environment, like a more comprehensive uh, trade, a reducing of the non-tariff barriers. These are not issues which are in the multilateral negotiations. So how do, 
how does how does multilateralism take into account uh, that that uh, factor? Uh, and uh, uh, so you need to change the way the governance of the multilateral uh, systems, and this goes into also the financial uh, and other areas, uh, and uh, and for emerging economies to give more, yeah. Uh, and shared leadership and governance by emerging uh, economies. But having said that, then how do we deal with one of the most important challenges which you mentioned? The proliferation of bilaterals and regionals because they are unsatisfied with the progress in multilateral negotiations, either because it's too slow or it's not covering the new issues. Here my take on that, given my experience in the region with regionalism, uh, you cannot avoid it. Let's take a realistic and a pragmatic view uh, on, on how to deal with bilateral and regional uh, uh, negotiations and uh, agreements. They should, be, uh, they should be ways forward, but let's never forget the multilateral uh, rules because you don't want business, you're all, a lot of business people in this room, you don't want different rules and standards and regulations, different rules of origin. You'd have to have a whole uh, department in your, in your company to figure all that out. It's a very high cost. It will exclude SMEs and it will exclude the poor countries from being able to participate in global trade. We don't want that kind of world and that's what we should avoid. And that's where as bilaterals and regionals move forward, you still need kind of the, the global rules or standards that, that they all would go towards. And that could be both ways. You, know, you, make, you want to make sure that these agreements are going to be open, transparent, and you know, comprehensive at some stage and multilateralized at some stage. And that's why the WTO is still important as, as the safeguarder of that. And to the extent that these agreements are going to address new issues, which are not yet negotiated, uh, that's where transparency matters. You don't, it's like having a club, right? If US-EU forms a club and they create standards that are so high that no other country can uh, attain, then it's not open. <laughs> that, that's probably the, the best way to describe it. And so how do you make it uh, open and mm -hmm. uh, help the lesser developed countries to be able to attain the standard or the system that's there? So that, that would be my take on how to continue multilateralism in today's world. That's, uh, thank you very much, Marie. I think that's a very good exposition of what's on all of uh, many of our minds. You know, this maybe the way forward is really to pursue this plurilateral approach mm -hmm. and then an open regionalism. Uh, but let me, let me ask you a little bit about these new issues that you refer to. Obviously, that's something on, 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 on many people's minds. I, in my mind, um, when you talk about trade, you really cannot avoid talking also about investments. Yeah. To me, it's really two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I recall that when the GATT was formed, the idea was to form a, a multilateral institution to govern trade, and then very shortly thereafter, to have something that will govern investments. But that really hasn't happened, as you know. Now, the question I'd like to address to you is, you know, is it now time to think about a multilateral institution to cover, to, to govern investments? And and you know the the, you know I I, I remember we tried in the nineties right, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the MAI and so on, uh, and it didn't didn't work. I think in those days it didn't work because the world was very much divided into investor economies and economies that took investments. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's absolutely blurred. You know, is, is China an investment, investing country mm. or a country that wants investments? Mm. Is America mm. an investing country or a country that wants mm. uh, uh, foreign direct investments? Mm. So, and, and there are a lot of questions about what rules may be needed to govern the activities of things like sovereign wealth funds. Mm. So what is your view? Is it time now to, to think about this very important new issue of investment? Mm -hmm. Should we be thinking about a multilateral institution? Should that be a new one? Or do you think it should be part of the WTOs and expand the WTOs purview? That's a good question. Uh, and I think in, for investment issues, 
definitely, if you talk about global value chain, uh, having investments coming into, you know, as a country, your policy should be, which part of the global value chain am I trying to uh, develop in right. my country and make right. it dynamic? Investments become a very important issue, especially in services, yeah? <clears throat> having the, the efficiency of services. So I, I would say both investment and services are important. Uh, if you, if you want to talk about a, a more dynamic uh, world of mm -hmm. trade and investment. Now, where should investment issue be? You know, if you, if you just 10 years ago, Cancun, all the developing countries walked out when the so-called Singapore issues were introduced. One of them yes. was investment. Yes. But I, I would say if you, re, if you take that forward to today's world, you're absolutely right. Uh, developing countries have also now become investors. So they are uh, interested. They would have a greater interest now to have investment uh, be addressed because they are also investors. And uh, in the regional agreements, even in Asia that we are doing, uh, which are less comprehensive and uh, so-called uh, high quality compared to what's happening in EU and uh, US, we also already have investments. Yeah? So I guess we're used to uh, <laughs> the issue now. It's not so, not so much a new issue anymore. Uh, uh, but the question then, next question is, where should it be addressed? Should it be in the WTO as uh, part of the uh, negotiations, uh, at just the trade-related aspects of uh, investment, or should it be more? I think at the end of the day, it should be more. It should be more comprehensive. But where do you start? Uh, I would say that uh, for the, the WTO, it should, they should deal with the trade-related investment issues, which you know, they are, there's already the trims, uh, yeah. the trade-related investment measures, right. like local content and so on, which are uh, so-called not allowed anymore. Now, that would be a start. Yes. And then we, we could work towards the more, the more multilateral investment agreements. And a good way to start is just to look at all the investment uh, components in the different uh, bilateral and regional agreements. And that may be uh, the way forward. But for, for, for developing countries, frankly, to look at the US uh, bilateral investment treaty, for instance, it's a very, very, it be very difficult for us to meet yes. that standard. So yes. uh, compared to where we are in, in the Asia, uh, investment agreements to where you are. You know, how, how are you going to bridge that? That's going to be a real challenge, I must say. No, thank you very much, Marie. I, I think that's a very good background, and I, I think it, it's a basis for us to really uh, think further about um, how we can really develop the next stage of multilateralism. Let me now, Jim, let me turn to you. I, you're, you're a real technologist. I, I've been very intrigued by the role that technologies can play. And you were here yesterday when we had a great discussion on innovation. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about China and whether China could really do the path-breaking and fundamental research type innovations uh, that, that, uh, that we're all basically talking about at the cutting edge. And, and as, you, as we all know, Chinese companies are beginning to play a much bigger role in this as in other areas as well. What are, what are your views? Yeah, oh, well, thank you, Victor. Um, f first, I would like to uh, thank you for your perfect hospitality here so far. So thank you very thank you. much. Okay. Uh, it's just been wonderful and it's a pleasure, <coughs> pleasure to be here. And uh, we look forward to reciprocating as hosts of the conference in Toronto next year. Thank so you. thank you very much yeah. for a remarkable job. Um, and thank you for that opening. And, and Ronnie and I have an agreement. Um, I'm, as a Westerner, I'm going to talk about the East, and he is an Easterner is going to talk about the West. So <laughs> we, we, you know, the grass is always greener, you, I guess. You empty the room. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I'm going to try and build upon two very interesting, two of the very interesting panels yesterday. Uh, the one on the shift, and and uh, and then two, the the one on the innovation systems and hopefully give a bit of provocation. And I'm gonna come at this um, to contrast Mary's um, more on the micro as a businessman than on the macro of multilateralism, but I think we can meet somewhere in that dialogue. Um, I think Michael Spence was right, and, and I felt like he was copying my notes, though of course <laughs> not, um, that, that managing this middle income trap is, is an enormous uh, imperative for China and, and when we talk Asia, the, the big thing is China right now. Um, and, uh, and this is an unprecedented set of design constructs, which I will shift to uh, a micro uh, aspect, in that never has it happened when the middle income emerging company or country or the emerging co country 
is the largest economy in the world or on the precipice of the largest economy in the world, um, the largest population of any country in the world, and the world's banker. So we're, we're into uncharted waters in, in terms of how and can and, and will this be done. And so, um, uh, but, but it's absolutely uh, imperative um, that China do this. And if, if it is imperative to do it and China has the resources to do it, then it means there is a systemic exercise in industrial upgrading. That, that comes with the territory. These com companies are gonna move up the value chain. Um, they're gonna have all the attendant attributes of moving up the value chain, which uh, we can talk quite a bit about, uh, hopefully, maybe. Um, but it, it, you know, the, the comments on innovation uh, and, and, and all of that, um, it's 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 myth like you know it's it's a false uh, discussion whether Chinese can innovate or not. Of course they can innovate, and of course they're formidable. This this is this is not a debate. This is an inevitability, um, and I, I think we just have to. I'm just going to put that right on the table. This is I mean. If there's any dispute, just look at what Huawei has done in the telecommunications sector that I, that I, I spent 20 years in. So, and, and you also look at things like the startup type um, uh, vibrancy and innovation and, and the, 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 that. So there, there is absolutely no question in my mind that, that these Chinese companies are going to emerge there is going to be industrial upgrading. It's going to be a unique design. I've interacted with these companies for a long time. Um, it's going to be a unique design construct to China in terms of the state's engagement in it and picking certain uh, sectors that they want to uh, be particularly good in in the five-year plan, that this micro-macro interplay uh, and how are they going to reform or not reform the varying factors that, that come into to, to this. But I think linking a little bit to the panel on innovation and, and some comments that Bill and David uh, yesterday, we see that there's a lot of systemic elements that come to play in the innovation game. And so don't think that the state doesn't have an enormous role to play in catalyzing and, and supporting these kinds of emerging aspects of, of business upgrading. So um, this is an inevitability. Uh, it's going to be unique to uh, China, and, and it's it's and uh, and and, uh, um, and and so I, I want to put those two pieces on the table. Now, here's my my main thing that I, I want to say: that if companies are going to emerge, that means. If somebody's going to go up the value chain, it pretty well means somebody else is going to have to go down. Um, if somebody's going to move into one, two, or three in the world, that means somebody's going to be bumped out of one, two, or three in the world. That's just the way it goes. Um, I'm not saying business is a zero-sum game, but there is disproportionate returns in business to those that are in the top spots. That's just the way it goes. Um, and so. When somebody goes up, so that means somebody else is going to have to go down. Um, and that means there's going to be losers. And those losers are usually going to be, are always going to be incumbents. And they're traditionally going to be Western. So um, I, I think this is the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, there, there, there's going to be tensions. Uh, this is going to shift wealth. It's going to shift jobs. Um, uh, so if this emergence is inevitable, um, what is the drama going to be like? Because when I look at China's emergence over the past generation, as remarkable as it's been, there's been profoundly few losers besides organized manufacturing labor in the West. But now we're in, a, in, a, in an era where there will be winners and will be losers. I'm not saying all the West is going to lose and all the win, but it's going to be a much more complex uh, drama. And, and, and is there a forum to manage these tensions? And, and how are people going to, to, to deal with it? And I'm going to link a little bit more to the IPR, because as you move up the value chain, you go into intangibles and the 
and we talked a bit about that and the, and the, 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 the nature of managing intangible systems. And, and I asked a question yesterday on what are the views on the new European Patent Court, the EPC that, that got voted on in December. What are the, what's the view on the new America Events Act? Uh, that was signed by Barack Obama in September, came into law last month, and it changed the systems in these, in these countries. Now, these are called sovereign domestic systems, but yet, as somebody who had about 400 active IPR files in my job and spent $6 billion on IPR in my last year of my job, I know that the nature of IPR is it may be a domestic dispute, but you always do global settle settlements. So it's, it's a de facto global multilateral system that's just adjudicated in the strong markets. So this whole, and as we move to intangibles, that how are we going to navigate this in a tension-laden, shifting global business system? So this whole relationship between innovation, IPR, productivity, and trade, I think they're all, and competitiveness, are all inextricably linked, and I think you're going to see pretty seismic shifts and tensions. And let me just finish before Ronnie talks about the West as I've talked about the East. Um, imagine this Novartis case that just happened last week in India. What would have happened if that case was in China? What would have happened if the, there was an incumbent competitor or an emerging competitor in pharmaceuticals in China? How would the drama have played out different? How would the tensions been managed? I suspect it would have been explosive. And, and this is going to be the regular norm, because this is what happens normally in business, but it's all just been contained to a Western pot. And once it goes into an East-West pot, we're, we're just into a new new. So I've sort of thrown all that stuff on yep. the table, and I'll give it to Ronnie next. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jim. Now, before I give it to Ronnie, Ronnie, I know it was raring to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and, and on this uh, question of winners and losers, you know, I, I have some very strong views also, but I'm going to let you guys debate it. But before you go there, let me ask you, with the rise of the uh, state-owned enterprises in China, and you mentioned Huawei and so on, um, do you think that the participation of the state in some of the companies allows from a multinational, multinational um, company's perspective kind of a level playing field? You know, it's one thing to compete. Would you, would you, would you think that there is a, 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 a feeling of you know, state participation making it perhaps not so level a playing field? Well, states have always participated in economics, so they just participate in different ways. And I'm no expert on the, these kinds of things, but the SOEs that I've dealt with, particularly contained to the domestic economy, um, they're not going to go away. It's a unique di design aspect of China. How that interplays with Huawei's not an SOE. So, um, yeah, this is a complex and interesting place. It tilts the playing field, but there's lots of tilted playing fields in, mm -hmm. in life. And quite frankly, what I'm trying to say is these new legislation of the EPC and the America Invents Act has tilted the playing field in a different way. Yeah. So tilting is life. Um, and. But, but I, 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 I wonder if that's a bit of a red herring sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's a legitimate concern and what's just a pretext for interfering in global business and trade. And I think this is really ripe stuff to study. And I'm not an expert and I don't want to punditize too much outside, outside of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, but I, I do think what's really great about this forum is as a participant in past ones, I think you're really opening up this element of innovation and seismic shifts and productivity and, and IPR and, and how it relates to trade. And, and I think this is really, really what everybody's worrying about, which is jobs and wealth and commerce and shifts in Europe, in Asia, in North America. And so I think you're on a hot point here Right. Uh, for the future of INET, and I'm excited to, to be a part of it. Thank you for that answer, Jim. Thank you. Ronnie, over to you. Well, first I uh, <laughs> congratulate uh, Victor for having the guts to, to ask me to come here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a danger. Uh, these people laugh, you guys didn't laugh because they know me. <laughs> um, I'm serious. I like the name of the Institute of New Economic Thinking. But as I look at the program, I look around in front of me, uh, it seems to me still uh, it is basically um, 
dominated by the West, which is understandable. Uh, you are the wealthy guys. You are the <laughs> more advanced economies. Uh, but I think that something Jim mentioned, I think, uh, bears a lot of uh, attention, and that is, for the first time, the world is perhaps moving uh, to a new ground that has never been seen before. Before 1700s, the East was strong. After that, the West was strong. The last time that the East and the West were strong together was perhaps 2,000 years ago during the Roman days and the, and, and, and the Han Dynasty of China. And that's 2,000 years ago. And so the world in the last 20, 30 years, or perhaps in the last 40, 50 years, if you started with Japan, is for the first time when you have the East rising. And a lot of people say the West waning. I, I, I would not pronounce the death of the West so fast. I don't think so. Uh, no, I'm not saying that you are doing it, Jim, but some Asians are, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. But nonetheless, the fact remains that the world for the last 2,000 years have always been one-legged. But for the first time, it is going to be a little bit more two-legged. And hence, the need for new economic thinking, I think, is humongous. And to the credit of the West, I think the West is, at least the Americans, have been really been able to reinvent itself quite well. And the fact that the West is now thinking about the new economic thinking, instead of the East starting the Institute of New Economic Thinking, it's our friend George Soros that funded something like that, I understand and get this thing going. I think that's uh, to the credit of the West. However, I'm also a reader of human nature. When you, have been so, when you have been successful so long, it is really questionable whether you can jump out of your skin, so to speak, because you have been successful and have really new economic thinking. And so I commend the organizer to bring this conference to Asia. Perhaps that's where the Asians can add to the world today. There's no question. In my mind, Asia needs to learn so much from the West. China needs to learn so much from the West. Among other things, a lot of the political systems. I think Asia has much to learn. But at the same time, if we are talking about new economic thinking, then I submit to you that perhaps Asia is the place where, at least equally, you should look upon as a source of new economic thinking. Because they have the benefit of being poor. They have the benefit of being the latecomer. They have the benefit of having to catch up. And for that reason, as we all know, necessity is the mother of invention. And we in Asia have the necessity to think out of the box. So where can Asia fit in this whole thing? I think Asia should be, as much as the West, a source of new ideas. I think if we were to still look at it from whatever perspective we are used to, and that includes many of us, Victor, mm. who are in Asia but are educated in the West, like you and me, <laughs> or like most of the people that are in this room, I think we sometimes are also somewhat constrained. So let me just very quickly give you one or two points and, uh, and then I'll stop. And um, because I'll be offended so many people by that time that you want me out. <laughs> you know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, the Sony chairman then wrote a book called Japan That Can Say No. And the reason it's so successful in the West at least so much talk about, is because it has the paradigm of the West, and that is, it is confrontative. And the West, because of your Judeo-Christianity tradition perhaps, is very confrontative. Heaven, hell, God, devil, you know, salvation, perdition. <laughs> and, and, and so you're used to confrontation. And so the book, the title, Japan that can say no. Wow, this is very confrontative, and you guys perk up and listen. 
And the Kisho, is Kisho here? No. Kisho. no okay. <laughs> anyway, Kisho wrote a book. Uh, many of you know Kisho, Kisho Mababani from Singapore wrote a book called Asia, Canadian Thing. Right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you from the West, can I add, take that one step further? Dare the West think. <laughs> Dare the West think beyond what you already know. I don't know if it come from the East. I don't know whether maybe it come from Africa or from, from Latin America. I don't know. But dare the West think beyond what you always think. And therein lies the new source of economic thinking, perhaps. You know, the West, for example, and the East have very different history and background civilization. I was talking to some friends, Neil Ferguson and a few others were having dinner at my home last night and we were saying and he was surprised when I told him that in Chinese oh Li Dao Kui, David Professor David Lee he, you were there uh, in, in Chinese literature you don't hear the word rights it almost doesn't exist Chen Li it doesn't exist in the Chinese vocabulary almost certainly not in our literature and so the Asians have a totally different orientation that perhaps while learning much from the West, in particular in its institution, which I think Asians are not good at, is institution building. But I think while learning that, perhaps the Asians can bring a totally different line of thinking. If not, I fear, because the, the title of this session is the, 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 the Future of the World and Asia's Role. If not, I fear that the West, given your philosophical orientation may bring yourself down and bring the world with you and that all of us will be fried. The financial service just four years ago were staring at the precipice and has much been changed. You talk to, I talk to my American friends in New York and DC. Still we want more freedom. We just need to regulate it better. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps regulation is not the whole solution. Obviously, we need to regulate better. But I think that there are some philosophical underpinnings that perhaps we need to change. For example, is more freedom always right? Should we not curb it at a certain extent? Whereas Asian probably need a lot more freedom. But perhaps the West has gone way too far as well. Is there some middle ground that we can all come back to? And so, so I think I, I, I better quit. I think that uh, I really commend you guys for, bring, uh, for forming this institute called the New Economic Thinking. I just suggest that perhaps we should jump out of our Western skin and perhaps accept some new ideas from the East to supplement that which is successful in the West. Hopefully, we will come up with some new economic thinking. Ronnie, should I leave now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ronnie, thank you. Every time I hear you speak, it reinforces my decision uh, to invite you, not only invite you, but you're an essential part of any conference of this type. <laughs> you know, some of our blood pressures may go up a little bit, but it makes us think. And I think that is absolutely the whole goal of the, the exercise. But I'm not going to let you go, uh, Ronnie, that, that, that quickly. <laughs> I, I, I want to bring you back to the real world and, 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 and beyond philosophy. How about the business world? What's your view about um, the corporations that will be coming from Asia, Chinese and, and otherwise, that will be emerging in the global scene? How, how do you think they will play out in the next decade? What role do you, do you think they would play? This, I'm going back to the question that Jim posed. This, um, this, this game, okay, I don't think it's a zero-sum game, by the way. Um, I didn't you know, say okay, yeah, I know, I know, but you, 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 you were sort of um, postulating different thoughts there. But let's see, what, 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 what do you think? What, what are the roles of the Asian-based multinationals that will be emerging in the global scene? Frankly, I'm not that positive, I'm probably not as positive as Jim is. I wasn't that positive. Oh, I, I said there's going to be tensions. <laughs> no. I, I said there's going to be tensions. Right. There's no, going to be I, I real tensions. I mean the Asian corporates. The Asian corporates. The, oh, that they will. Yeah. No, they, I, I, I'm not that optimistic oh. about the Asian corporates. Okay. Oh. 
Uh, not that they cannot innovate and so forth, Jim. I agree with much of what you have said. But I think that the, Eastern, uh, the, the Asian corporates have a long way to go. Recently, just look at what has happened in the New York Stock Exchange and in the NASDAQ. All those Chinese companies that are listed there, a lot of them are in now in, in, in regulatory trouble. And you know, some of, many of us in this part of the world could have told you, well, not the mainland Chinese, sorry, but for the most part, huh? Liu Mingkang, perhaps, with your exception, <laughs> you are being accepted, <laughs> exception. Uh, most of us could have told you that much of these Chinese companies that are listed in, 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 in New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ will be in regulatory trouble. And that's because there's no governance system in the East. Forget about good or bad. They just don't have it. And like it or not, the West, as far as I'm concerned, the, gov the corporate governance is far better. And so they just have to take, it takes time for them to learn. And then, in the, so far, the Chinese companies, for example, Jim, that you referred to, for the most part, they are doing it by brute force. They're trying harder, but they're not necessarily trying smarter. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, I think they have a long way to go. Uh, look at the Japanese companies. Japanese companies have been really powerful for about, what, 20 years? And then now you see even the, elect uh, the, 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 the consumer electronics and so forth, right, having a hell of a hard time. Uh, the banks have, the Japanese banks have never been, you know, in the forefront of anything, except size, at one point. And so I think the whole of Asia, now, now is the Koreans' turn. Now, will they be able to get out of this, uh, this, this, this cycle? I'm not sure. I think it's way too early to tell. And I think that the, I would pin my hope on the smaller companies, mm. the technology companies of China and of Asia in general. Perhaps some of those can uh, have a better chance of leapfrogging and become somebody in the global scene. Maybe what we're going to see from Asia is not so much the giants and that will be the global multinationals, but really a whole um, uh, uh, a large group of SMEs and family enterprises that will be entering the arena. Uh, and, and that may be the, the real force coming from Asia. And I think that's what you're really alluding to. There's still a lot that we need to do in Asia. And I think the, the whole idea of corporate governance and so on. But before I open up to the audience for your comments and questions, let me come full circle back to the multilateral. Now, you guys have described a lot at the, at the company level. I think in the midst of all this, we cannot forget a more human dimension. I think, frankly, when companies compete, the people that feel the effect would be the workers and the jobs. And how jobs are being uh, 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 allocated around the world uh, on the basis of the evolution of the global system, on the evolution of global supply chains, I think is a very important question. And not only the number of jobs, but the level of jobs, I think is going to be very interesting. And we talk a lot about the fact that as we actually created a lot of economic wealth and as economic pie got bigger in the past decades, and I, I really am fully subscribed to the, 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 the credit that the multilateral system uh, has, has given us, the opportunity to create uh, much prosperity. We've we've actually witnessed a fairly um, large, um, shall we say, an imbalance in the distribution side. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the equity in terms of distribution of income. Marie, I, I wonder if I can come back to you. If you go back to the multilateral level and the multilateral institutions, what are the opportunities for us to not only address growth, but to actually think about this issue of income inequality, and which I think is going to, at the end, if we don't address it, it's going to be a major issue. We'll be causing stability issues everywhere. Uh, how, how do you think that, 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 that could be really a, a, a weaved into our multilateral frameworks? OK, uh, I, I will answer your question. But as part of the answer to my question, I'd like to respond to sure, these please. two gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, and uh, it's about the rise of the East and the West and so on, and how we're going to, I think uh, Jim posed a very interesting question about you know, when, when you have losers, who's going to manage yeah. the tensions that arise and what countries will do as a result of it? 
Uh, I think ultimately, and I think you and I have spent 20 years talking about this, <laughs> you want global trade and investment, right? You, you, you don't want it to be regional or bilateral. Right. And it should be governed by global overarching rules, regulations, and standards, where you want a place for everyone in that global value chain. But it has to be a moving one. Because we are no longer in trade in goods world, we're in trade in tasks world. So you can be any, any part of the global value chain. And uh, someone very wise said this, multilateralism democratize, democratizes the global economy. There is indeed a place for everyone. And the world must return to the multilateralism as an ideal that has served us well in the past, and that has to be the only way forward because dispersed manufacturing is the way of the future with even more segmentation of the global <laughs> production system and efficient, uh, and it's based uh, on efficiency and economic argument because you have specialized division of uh, labor. That very wise man is this gentleman here <laughs> in uh, 2005. <laughs> so, and I still think what you said still holds, okay? And uh, if you didn't have this, your losers, what will they do? They will think, okay, did I lose because of unfair trade or investment? Did they do something which is not level playing field, et cetera, et cetera? Who's going to say whether that was fair or unfair? You need an impartial objective judge, which is you know, the WTO rules and dispute settlement and so on. Yeah. And if the, the actual thing that's being said to be unfair is not yet in the uh, WTO rules, then we have to update the rules including IPR, including all those other issues that you, you mentioned, okay? If it's not because of unfair trade, but because you are losing competitiveness, how much right do I have as a country? This gets to the equity argument. I, I'm a, you know, I, at the end of the day, we are all politicians we're, when we are ministers and we have to face, when we are policy makers. How am I gonna face those who are really gonna lose because of uh, declining competitiveness? What kind of policy space do I have to protect or to slow down or to introduce subsidy or whatever? Again, you're going to need somebody or some institution which is going to be the impartial judge of it, right? And that's why I say the multilateralism is still important for that reason. And uh, because of the development concerns that you uh, correctly emphasize, uh, this is why uh, the, the, the fact that a large number of the members are the developing countries, you're not talking about the big players anymore. Uh, what's going to happen? If you have the big players fighting, all the small players are going to get hurt. If you don't have rules, the big player will have, we can do anything they want against the small players. So the small players will lose out. How do you make sure that the small players who are often small developing countries have the capacity you know, so this is inequity between countries. We, you also have inequity within countries, which you have to deal with. So inequity between countries can only be dealt with, uh, you know, I, I still believe that having seen how trade transformed my own country uh, for, for positive benefits, and I think China has also gone through similar process. How do you bring countries' capacity to integrate into the world economy? Right. And that's part of the uh, negotiations, is this capacity building aid for trade, for want of a better word. You need to have this process of bringing them up. And it's, it's uh, in the Asian context, where, where we've actually thought a lot about this in the ASEAN and East Asia context, it's not just about bringing them into the, uh, into the uh, world, integrating them into the world economy, but it's the only way that they're gonna be able to continue process of opening up. Uh, because they have to make that argument uh, back to their uh, domestic constituencies that, okay, we're, we've, got in, we've got five years before we have to open up. In, in that five years, this is the kind of capacity building we're getting, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's kind of the way you have to structure, um, you know, this is again going back to APEC language, the third leg of APEC, right? <laughs> uh, liberalization, facilitation, capacity and capacity building. They, they have to be integrated, not just uh, an appendix uh, and a feel good, okay, I've done my bit to help uh, those less developed. It has to be integrated. Thank you very much, Marie. That, that was incredibly important, what Marie has just said. You know, I, I, sometimes we tend to, when we talk multilateralism, when we talk WTO, we tend to think only of trade negotiations. It's absolutely much, much more than that. And, and I, I think uh, you have reminded us of the greater purpose of that multilateral system. And I think that's really fantastic. Now, there's not much time left. I think it's time to open up 
the questions to uh, the audience. Uh, happy to take your questions. Please identify yourself and address your question to uh, any one member of the panel or, or the panel generally. Yes, right here. Gentleman here. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I'm Cliff Tan. I'm, I work for the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, UFJ. Uh, I just want to let Ronnie know that I have slimmed down in the last year. So. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I, 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 there's something I heard in all of your discussion uh, which I want to ask about, which is what do you think the potential is for Asian countries to turn more protectionistic over the next decade? Because, you know, I guess uh, piggybacking on what Jim said, you know, if there are going to be winners and losers, you know, I mean, we, in Asia, we tend to think that we're always going to support free and open trade. But from where you sit, do you see any possibilities that we might actually turn more protectionistic in the next decade? And then I wanted to ask about IPR protection because yesterday we had a, a discussion about banded um, innovation <laughs> in China. Uh, I'm asking because uh, when I lived in the Silicon Valley a few years ago, and this issue of indigenous innovation came up in China, I reached out to a, a few tech companies and just asked them about how that might affect their businesses in China. And I was a little surprised that it wasn't that big of a deal to a lot of these companies because they had already been used to the issue of protecting their IPR in China. So there was already you know, a, a situation in which they were not being very careful not to move too much technology to China uh, under the current IPR regime. And so, you know, so it really got me thinking about, you know, yes, maybe banded innovation allows you to copy a smartphone, but you know, what does it really do to encourage technology transfer? And again, my question is very specific. It was about whether Asian countries trust each other enough to transfer technology within Asia itself. Those are my questions. Thank mm, you. Interesting. Jim, I think they're right in your bailiwick. Wow. I mean, that, that's, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky, tricky question. Um, I'm going to open the aperture a little bit in that just about every business is going to be affected by technology. So um, I, I just think all uh, industries are going to be shifted by, by technology. So maybe you've had some of these Silicon Valley companies. Yes, they've protected, but I, I was on the U.S. Business Council and, and, and managing IPR and the, and the e, e, East from the West was kind of half of the last meeting. And, and the, a lot of these are traditional manufacturers doing you know, machinery and, and, and stuff like that and consumer goods. And so as you make a more consumer culture, um, you know, this, this, could, this is not just Silicon Valley tech companies, though it includes Silicon Valley uh, tech companies. It, from the constituency I knew, it was a big deal. Um, for these little st startups or, or medium startups that are swashbuckling, yeah, you're, you're right, it's, it, it, it's a different dynamic. But uh, I, I think they're going to insert themselves. Uh, you know, if you get involved in these, see these lobbying activities and and, and as Mary appropriately said, what is fair and unfair uh, is not really determined yet. And, and again, I will go back to my point that IPR is a domestic concern, yet when you get down the barrel of a gun, you have to do a global settlement so, because that's the way these things are done. So um, I, I, think this is, I think this is really far more, and, and when you see economies suffering and needing productivity and innovation, and people and, and, and the swings of, of the fate of these companies and jobs and wealth is so dramatic in this. Um, I, I think this is going to come way more to the front. And, and I would challenge your comment on brute force, because quite frankly, that's what the Koreans did in memories and processors and componentry, and that's what the Japanese did before it. It's a precursor, to, you know. It's a prelude to a kiss. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 I see. I see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I, I thought, <laughs> no, yeah, I think. Uh, Thanks, Robin um, Meredith, yeah. um, author of The Elephant and the Dragon. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, what you think this new era of globalization that you're talking about will be like. You've talked about the end of China's factory to the world. 
We've seen a lot of job effects and income inequality effects as a result of that move. But as China moves up the value chain, and we tend to focus more on the domestic Chinese market, are you not going to see creation of, of relatively fewer jobs because of technology uh, along the way, even in factory jobs? And does that not mean that not only the middle class in the West will continue its hollowing out and income inequality uh, growth, but that you also may struggle to create enough jobs in the East for a middle class to develop more fully? Could you talk about that and where okay. else is interested? Um, Maria, would you like to take that? Maybe Ronnie, you have a view? Well, yeah. I think, it, let's just focus on Asia. I mean, Asia is going to have continued growth uh, in uh, terms of the size, the middle class. Uh, parts are aging, parts are still going to be very young. So basically, you're still going to have a huge demand for goods and services. So uh, I think it, it's more not a hollowing out, but how to be smart in moving up the value chain. Uh, as you are no longer competitive in the low cost, uh, low labor cost intensive kind of manufacturing, you move on. And even in the way you market, or even if you, the way you access services, it, the technology actually helps. Technology and innovation will help to create more jobs, in my opinion. Uh, and it will be more in the kind of services area. Uh, and, and I also think it will uh, be more beneficial for entrepreneurship and SMEs because it you know, the, the kind of the, what, would you, what do you call it, the, the cost, the overhead cost and the uh, investment cost, capital investment right. cost, right. becomes much lower. And in, a, in my country, which is 50% uh, of our population is below 29 years old, and we are very interconnected, you know, and all of them have, um, most, a lot of them have Blackberries <laughs> and uh, smartphones or whatever. So the way of doing business, even the way you do uh, political campaigns, the way you reach out uh, to, to your uh, constituencies, it's all become uh, based on technology. And a lot of business comes out of it, a lot of innovation comes out of it, a lot of apps, uh, that kind of uh, world comes out of it. So I think, uh, and China, I think, is doing this too. The, you, you migrate towards services, which can create lots of jobs and opportunities. And in a, in a big country like China, India, or Indonesia, you really uh, can access remote areas through technology. So the investment in, in, in the ICT infrastructure, besides all the other investments, becomes crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Ronnie? My worry is as much in the, for the West as for the East. Uh, China, after all, it's only what 50% of the economy is a uh, service. If you were to go back to go to go up to uh, the level of the West, such as 70, 80%, there's a lot of job creation there at least. So they would somehow make do. My worry is America. America uh, may yet become the manufacturing center of the world again, at least one of them, uh, just like in the 1950s because of technology, 3D printing and robotics and what have you. And when that happens. Uh, I just wonder uh, what will happen because service industry is already 80% roughly in, in that part of the world. Mexico invites me every year to go speak because they were afraid of China taking all the jobs away. And I said, don't worry about China, you should worry about America because they're <laughs> going to take all the jobs away from you, but it's not by their workers, it's by the machines. So I think that that is a, a, a global phenomenon. Allow me to just go back to my bankers, uh, uh, my question. I, I've been your bank, uh, you have been my banker for 35 years. Uh, Asian, uh, uh, will, will, will protectionism come from the, from the Asian countries, uh, 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 yeah, countries? I don't think so. There's two kinds of play, uh, co uh, players that will be protectionists. One is really poor, cannot compete, uh, and, and they protect, and then they go to hell. The other is, they are already the vested interests, they are the winners, so they want to protect, right? Uh, Asia, in, for the most part, has, at least, you know, not just Japan, Korea, but also uh, China, has risen to a point where it's no longer really, really the underlings. Uh, and so protectionism is not to their advantage. In fact, uh, they don't want in protectionism. But by the time they get to one day, perhaps, uh, become the, the king of the world, if they ever get that, which I don't think so, perhaps protectionism from the East will happen. Look at what happened uh, 10 years ago only, 12 years ago, that globalization was something that the West has really advocated because they, wanna, they, 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 want, to, they want the Asian markets. 
And eventually, when, when, when Asian, okay, fine, we'll open up, uh, we, we give, and then we, we want to be part of the game, then what happened? It is not the East that is now advocating protectionism. It's the West that I worry as far as protectionism is, is concerned, because they found out that globalization is not what they think they are. They thought they're going to take advantage of the other people's market. Now they found out that other people are taking advantage of their market. So I think the worry for me for the time being is still the West and not the East. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one last question, and that hand's been up for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Durloff, University of Wisconsin, and the uh, INET uh, Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Global wor uh, Working Group. So I actually have two questions. One, do you see it, and this is really for the whole panel, a tension between bilateral agreements and multinational uh, agreements, by which I mean one of the issues in minimizing the uh, problems of the non-positive uh, some aspects of trade is to have more players involved so that uh, that the overall uh, positive sum nature is reinforced at the expense of the zero sum. And I worry that some of the uh, bilateral agreements are going to make it more difficult to take the next step. And the second was to register a dissent for uh, Ronnie Chan. I didn't think he was nearly provocative enough. And I would like him to, uh, to uh, since Westerners love uh, lecturing the rest of the world on the virtues of freedom, I, are there specific aspects of the, uh, that you were referring to in terms of needing to think about less freedom? Okay, uh, with that, why don't we just have uh, three minutes from each of the panel and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, Marie? Um, I don't think bilat yeah. bilateralism uh, versus multilateralism, it, should, it, it doesn't have to be versus. If we, we are cognizant of what kind of principles do you want to have to make sure that bilateral agreements or even regional agreements uh, will move towards the multilateral trading system. And I think that requires you to have certain principles like that they have to be WTO plus. They have to maintain uh, the benchmark as, as the, the multilateral trading system. And the, if the idea of bilateral agreements is kind of to, to help move the process forward, then you have to have open, how do, how do you add members? You know, how, do you make, how do you multilateralize it? Uh, and even have the capacity for the lesser developed members uh, to enter into, into, into the agreement. And, uh, and if they are addressing issues which are not yet addressed in the WTO, can you actually uh, shape the way forward for, for you know, the global rules in some time in the future? But for that to happen, obviously, you should not be doing rules or, or uh, agreements that are going to be impossible or difficult for anybody else to join if your intention is you know, building blocks as versus stumbling blocks. So these are some of the principles. And so I think, I think that's where the WTO still needs to play a role in terms of, well, in, you might want to make it stronger in some time in the future, but at the moment, it's basically uh, confined to transparency and monitoring. Now, whether you want to go further, I think that depends on hopefully this, what, what is often termed as the spaghetti bowl effect, how bad that becomes. And I hope by, if it becomes bad, the business sector is going to be the, one, the first to scream to say, no, this is not, not, not right. You, know, you have to change this. Or the, you know, the developing countries or the small countries who are not going to be part of that. You know? So I think, I think this is still a, a big debate out there. But we, as long as we keep in mind the final aim of, of the trade is global uh, and how to make that uh, global, I think that's, that's really the, the main thing. Great. We'll need 20 three minutes, minutes and then Jim, three minutes. I will be three months. 20 some years ago when the Big Bang happened in the, in the financial market, it was fantastic. It was really great. It really unleashed a lot of good things. But look, look what freedom has brought the world. You have fiat money on top of that. You have leveraging. You know, during the Asia financial crisis, they were leveraged 33 to 1. And then the, uh, in the 2008, 2009, Morgan Stanley of Goldman Sachs admitted they were leveraged 60 to 1. So you have fiat money on top of that. You have leverage. And on, on top of leverage, you have derivative. They have secondary derivative upon pr primary derivatives and so on and so forth. And so at the end of the day, look what happened. 1998, during the Asia financial crisis, there were two trillion US dollars sloshing around the world every day. Today. 15, 16 years later, how much is that number? Nobody knows. Five trillion, seven trillion, whatever it is. It's a lot bigger than two trillion. And in those days, 98% of them, 95% of them were not accountable for by trades of goods and services and reasonable hedging. Now today, perhaps 98% of them is not accountable for by those legitimate, what I call, activities. That means 98% of them are speculation. 
And yet we are still trying to make it faster, bigger. Uh, is faster better necessarily? Yes, in general, but up to a certain point. Is bigger better? Yes, up to a certain point, right? Uh, and, and the West, however, is still pushing and pushing and pushing in the wrong direction as far as I'm concerned. Big Bang is good, it moved to a certain extent, but perhaps now is a time to say, should we not stop at a certain point? And, and there's a philosophical barrier in the West that still think that if a guy like me who says that freedom perhaps ought to be curbed, I would not be allowed into America tomorrow. <laughs> you come to camp. It is just it, it is just politically incorrect, and unless the West can get over that barrier, that uh, that mindset, otherwise, I think you know the five trillions, whatever a trillion U.S. dollars every day sloshing around the world uh, is going to kill not only the Western system but the rest of us w w with it. And we we were almost there in 2008 November. And I believe that if we don't change fundamentally, not just mucking around at, on, on the fringes, we will have another financial crisis that will bring the whole economy in the West down, and of course, we'll be dragged down by it. Jim? I'll be very brief. Um, I think that's an excellent question, and, and I think it beckons a core strategic issue for INET and the participants here. And, and, I, and I think this is really good, healthy tension. What part of the research is, you know, more theoretical, and what part of it is more, you know, on the ground? What, what's going on? And uh, and so you've really talked about the global governance issues and regional versus global, and these multilateralism does it work and all that. And quite frankly, that's what excited me as a, a supporter and a sponsor institutionally of. Uh, of INET with CG, and so I, I encourage this to become a bigger and bigger part of the INET work, and I think you're gonna be really hitting the tip of the spear of, of core issues in the world, which we look forward to your leadership in the next generation. Um, I think the second part, which was part of that panel yesterday, which was not as much as your question, but this here, is this whole aspect of innovation, productivity, as it relates to trade and, and, and these kinds of things. And again, I think that's really pushing another strategic agenda for INET. So if you're going to do economic thinking, make sure you hit all the super relevant issues of the time in the world. And, and I, think, I think this is going to keep us busy for a long, long period of time if, if the leadership of INET wants to pick up the ball and run with it. And I think you've done a great job in moving the agenda into these kinds of areas because you have a lot of practitioners up here that are also respectful of the great academic research. Well, thank you for that, Jim. And I, I think that's a very good note to close on. Uh, this is absolutely the type of forum that INET and uh, the Fung Global Institute and CG would really be very much want to be a part of. But what I'd like to just leave you one final thought. For those of us who are in the private sector, who are businessmen, we need to think about the following. Even if we came up with new economic thinking and new ideas, how are we going to action that? And I would like to just make a call to action uh, to members of the business community. I, in, in my mind, if you look at the, the governmental sector, the NGO, and then the business sector, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind to get things done at this stage in the global development, the business sector has to act. So how do you take those new ideas that will be generated so well in forums like this into really practical implementations that will make a difference for the people in the world. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our panel, and thank you for attending. Well done. Thank you.